and um, <laughs> Can everybody hear me, first of all? Yeah? I do apologize, you have to listen to a northern British accent through a microphone. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Um, but Alison, thank you uh, for the wonderful introduction there. And what an honor and a privilege, can I just say, to be invited by Alison to do this final talk of your lecture series. And a really, really incredible week. I've been hearing awesome feedback from the rest of the girls. So um, yeah, kudos to you guys for sticking it out this long. And hopefully we can uh, finish off with this really iconic animal. So I'm going to introduce you the great white shark of Southern African waters, and then I'm going to hand over to Dr. Alison Cock, and she'll uh, give the false bay rundown. So I don't think this shark species really needs much introduction. They're obviously quite charismatic in profile. Carcharodon carius is the largest carnivorous fish. Now I hear the microphones on. <laughs> um, widely distributed, of course, very cosmopolitan distribution, can inhabit both temperate and tropical oceans. And obviously there's been a considerable amount of science done on this animal because of its very critical ecological role, but also because of its delicate conservation status. And um, I also believe during the course of the week you've been doing quite a lot of talking about diet, stable isotope analysis, trophic positions. Well, the really cool thing about great white sharks is that they are super diverse in their diet, like most of our elasmobranchs. And they also show that size differentiation as they grow with, with ontogeny, they change and they shift their diets. So sort of sub three meters total length, the great white shark is considered still a juvenile and therefore its diet is generally based more around sort of uh, other species of fish, smaller sharks. It's what we call more of a piscivorous based diet. And uh, in relation to that, their tooth shape is actually more cuspid. So they have more pin like sort of teeth to, to, to grab onto fish based prey. As they get bigger, of course, the adductor muscles between their jaws start to become more elasticated, their teeth widen out, and then with the isotope studies done here in South Africa, we found that they actually have a lot more mammalian prey uh, start to arrive in their diets. So things like pinnipeds, your seals, and of course, these photos went viral last week, whale blubber. Now, a whale carcass is sort of it's a real banquet of food for a great white because, of course, the, the blubber is very calorific, very fat dense, but it's actually quite a rare opportunity for them to come across these sort of floating carcasses at sea. So what happened last week in Hawaii was three extremely large great whites were encountered around this whale carcass. And, of course, this free diver, Ocean Ramsey, got some incredible interactions out of those uh, uh, experiences. But often the very large white sharks are associated with these whale carcasses. And it's deemed that possibly they could be using them as also opportunities to meet other reproductively mature white sharks, sort of one of the rare opportunities they would cross paths with each other. But it's not been proven scientifically. However, never say never with science or with great whites, because here in Al um, Algoa Bay in South Africa, a colleague of both mine and Alison's, Dr. Matt Dickin, published a paper on a whale carcass there where young of the year white shark pups were feeding on it. So a paper was put out just at the end of last year uh, called Future Directions in White Shark Research. And this was a global collaborative effort between 43 experts. Uh, both Alison and myself were invited on board. In fact, Alison was one of the lead sort of main writers of the article. And what it did was review the effort of research that's currently going on in the world with great whites and sort of put a roadmap out of where we need to gauge our future uh, efforts. So what you can see first and foremost, these colors are distributions of great whites from large scale movement data. So they're satellite tracks. And as we can see, they're temperate and pelagic inhabitants. Most of the research effort has actually been concentrated in the Northeast Pacific. And that's where the US is. That's where the big funding is. The federal state protects them. Uh, California, the Farallon Islands, all of those areas. And actually, the field is extremely male dominated. As you can see, 74.4% of white shark scientists are males. In fact, this morning, I was just trying to count on my two hands. How many females do I know that have led a paper on white sharks? And I can only get to 10. So we must actually touch base on that. So you're quite lucky to have me and Alison talking to you about white sharks today. Um, as you can see, 42.9% of the focus there, and then down in the southern hemisphere, resources, particularly in South Africa, are very limited for studying them. So 28 and 23% Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, respectively, in terms of efforts. So the main issues that came out that, that should be concentrated on for white shark research in the future are these following 10 um, hypotheses. So we need more information on their population numbers. 
We also need more information on their reproduction because still to date, nobody has ever seen great white sharks breeding in the wild or documented um, the mating. So that's two key aspects of their reproduction we still don't understand fully. We need to know more about their driving factors of movement, what causes them to migrate. Is it abiotic or biotic? Both, we know that, but what are the real driving factors? How can we quantify them? Obviously, critical habitats are very important to understand when you're trying to conserve a species and also how those change as the shark grows. Where and how frequent white sharks are out of those key habitats is equally as important. Also, we need diet studies, trophic positions of the prey species they eat and themselves. And of course, climate change is a huge, huge, huge issue. In fact, if anything, that's probably one of the most pertinent topics as we move into the future with, with actually the majority of our ocean inhabitants. And finally, reducing negative shark-human interactions. I know Sarah and Tammy gave a great talk yesterday about that whole concept. And of course, with our growing populations of humans on this planet, more people in the ocean, in some areas, white sharks are showing recoveries in numbers. We obviously need to really hone down on how to holistically manage the issue of shark-human interaction. And finally, economic and ecological role of shark tourism. So one thing uh, we always refer to here in South Africa is that these great white sharks we encounter along our coast are not South African. They are Southern African, and that is a completely different ball game. It complicates their conservation tremendously, because as you can see, these are just 12 animals that were satellite tagged in Hansby in 2012. Uh, American ship came down, both Alison and I were part of this, this research project. These guys go all over the place. I often say, where do white sharks go in South Africa? Open a jar of marbles and spill it on the floor. That's how much continuous uh, sort of regularity there are to their movements. Some individuals show this super pelagic offshore movement. Others stay really coastal. And of course, they move across borders. So they go to Namibia, they go to Mozambique, the Seychelles, the subantarctic. And historically, we had a female go from Dyer Island in Hansby to Australia and back in 2003. Now, in South Africa, we've got four aggregation sites that are sort of key areas that we can reliably find great white sharks. And this is where most of the research has been focused within our country. So False Bay is where Alison has done most of her studies, and she's going to tell you uh, a lot more about that at the end here. But of course, Hansby, 120 kilometers east, is also an aggregation site for them. Straight along the garden route on the south coast, Mossel Bay, again, an aggregation site for them. And finally, Port Elizabeth, Algoa Bay, an aggregation site. And what characterizes them is the fact that they've got these seal colonies very close to the shore, but also uh, inshore reefs that have an abundance of prey species that will attract any sort of age or size category of animal. And of course, um, perfect environmental conditions as well. Now, the first topic I'm going to touch on from that list is some studies that we've done here in South Africa on counting white sharks. But first of all, I want to bring it into perspective. Because here you see a global map of white shark distribution, and you see some random numbers. These numbers differ quite dramatically, because counting white sharks is a really difficult task. Let's face it, they move around. Researchers have limited access to them often. They have different sampling periods. Um, they have different methods. And so we still don't have a robust, reliable global estimate. Some people say there could be less than 5,000 white sharks on the planet. Some people say 15,000. But the, the real um, crux of it is, without the um, adequate standardized modeling techniques, it's a really difficult topic to approach. So I'm going to show you why South Africa is a bit of a question mark. Because we have a little bit of um, sort of conflicting uh, sort of uh, studies going on here. Um, Rabia Radcliffe in Mossel Bay, she initially in 2013 put out this number of 389 white sharks between Hart and Boss Fruitback and Seal Island in Mossel Bay. Her study went from 2009 to 2011. She used photo ID, so just so you know, to fingerprint a great white shark capture a picture of its dorsal fin, you process that in your computer, and then you can match that individual with, with new photos that come into your database. Algoa Bay then, Matt Dickin, actually published his paper, and he counted 53 white sharks in 22 trips to Bird Island. He didn't model his data. So as you can see, some are counts, some are actual model data, some are different types of estimates. In 2013, myself and the team in Hansby, we put out a paper for that region. Our data wasn't seasonally collected, it was consistently collected. We catalogued 532 individual sharks, we used nine different population models, and then we came out with an estimate of between 800 to 1,008 in that time period. And then straight after that, 
uh, Sara Andreotti in the same area, an uh, Italian researcher, put out a paper saying there were 333 white sharks in the South African population, but she sampled Hansby for 2.5 months times three seasons and didn't actually look at the inshore area. She just used Dyer Island. Then she did a genetic study where she went to four locations along the coast. So quite clearly researchers in the country had a bit of an issue with that because it's like me coming into the Cromer building today and counting every student in here and saying, that's representative of the entire university stock of students in South Africa. It's extrapolation. And not just that, there were problems with the model. And so basically, when in science people don't agree, we have this refusal process or commenting papers. And that's what gives healthy science. We all learn from it. Not everybody has to agree. But Dylan Arian put out his um, refusal, and then they responded accordingly. So finally, Alison will touch on this abundance estimate now for False Bay. Over nine years, Adrian Hewitt, who was a student of Alison's, put out a number of 303. But as you can see, it's, it's very, yeah, different random sampling periods. And sorry, that's just to show you the process of photo ID. So you can see the dorsal fins of the sharks. We used a computer software program. Others didn't. Um, and you can see there the discovery curve is reaching sort of what we call an asymptote. So there was no recruitment into the stock at that time, hence why we decided to model the data. Um, in a nutshell, white sharks move. That makes it complicated to count them. There's also the issue of capture heterogeneity to consider. So when you go out on a, a research vessel or a cage diving boat, you're physically chumming the shark to the boat. Now, you're only seeing the bold portion of the population there. And there are many sharks we know through acoustic um, passive tracking from receivers on the seabed that don't actually respond. Therefore, you're only, you're only capturing a small amount of the animals. Um, so the model needs to take that into account. Software, there's big debates about whose software is the most accurate. Ours got slandered because it was used for dolphins. Um, there's just many, many different aspects. But the main thing is Dylan Irian is now putting a paper together where he's taking what we call an integrated approach. And that's the real way forward. So rather than just looking at photo ID, he's going back through all the historical catches in fisheries. He's putting in genetics data, obviously photo ID as well, and telemetry data. And then we can build a much more robust and reliable figure of how many sharks we think there may be. Another aspect that we've looked at here in South Africa is environmental influences and how they uh, affect our great white sharks. And of course, this continent has the most incredible oceanography, particularly off the Western Cape, where you've got our Agullus and our Benguela currents sort of dancing around with each other. So Alison had a student called Kay Wells in False Bay uh, in 2013. And Kay and I both did quite similar studies, mine being in Hansbag, on white shark sightings and how water temperature and different environmentals affect them. So Kay's approach was using shark spotters data from Musenberg and Fisher Beach. And what she did is she used these models called general, generalized additive mix effect models. And they were allowing her to look at shark sightings data from the spotters, um, things like swell height, wind direction, lunar phase, sea surface temperature, to see if anything has an effect on their numbers. Down the coast in Hansby, I was out on the Marine Dynamics cage diving boat. I was physically sampling the water uh, next to the vessel while um, identifying individuals. And I used a similar model. It was a standardized general linear model. And I looked at the same sort of um, parameters, but also including climatic phase, but not lunar phase. So Kay's study was actually really interesting in that she found a very, very prominent trend with water temperature and with lunar phase. And if you look at the way that she's presented her results, I think it's really cool. So eight and five times higher likelihood in warmer water, so 18 degrees Celsius as opposed to 14 degrees, at Musenberg and Fisher beaches of sighting a white shark. And also with lunar phase, 1.5 and four times more likely in the new moon than the full moon at Musenberg and Fisher to see white sharks. The chances were higher. So, also, there was a dial effect in Fishhook, 1.6 times more likely in the afternoon to see a white shark. Interesting, not in Musenberg, there was no effect there. But um, another thing to note is in her sampling period, she was seeing more great white sharks over time. That's around 2013 that that was going on. Similarly, I also got that trend of warmer water temperature and higher white shark sightings. And um, what was really cool about this is I was able to get a, a gender on the sharks I was seeing being right next to them on the cage diving boat. So obviously some we had male, some we had female, and the unsexed ones we, we discarded. Um, and there was 
an increased trend not only with white sharks and water temperature, but particularly with female white sharks and water temperature. So they prefer the warmer, warmer um, profiles. And the males, because what happened during the sampling phase, we had a La Nina event, which is the colder phase of, of our climatic um, phases. And so the males basically spiked in numbers during that period. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with El Nino and La Nina, the climatic uh, perturbations that happen every five to seven years. And depending on whether we're La Nina or El Nino, we're either in a cold water or warm water phase. But the effects are so diverse around the planet. It affects agriculture, it affects ocean currents, it affects wind patterns. Um, but it was just so, so interesting to see that affect our, our shark gender composition. Lots of discussions as to why maybe females require warmer waters for their higher growth rate demands. Maybe it's competitive exclusion, maybe it's sexual segregation. There's lots of discussions around it. But the main thing is both Kay and I have picked up on the fact that water temperature does matter. And of course, Kay's uh, data was used by shark spotters to put into bay the safety protocols. Now it's really good to have that knowledge that the warmer the water, the higher the chance. And of course, long-term distribution of the species, particularly with climate change, with Gulf streams moving, we could see a real alteration in white shark distribution if our seas continue to get warm. OK, so um, another study we did down in Hans Bay. I'm sure you guys have had telemetry mentioned to you quite a bit this week, different types of tags that you can put onto sharks to see where they go. Focused a lot of time in Hans Bay on um, active tracking great whites. So you can liken this to going to the Kruger Park, the biologist puts the collar on the leopard and has the antenna and then drives around the bush to find said leopard and track its movement. So we did that on uh, our white sharks in hands by. It was 14 sharks ranging in size from two and a half meters to four and a half meters, um, both males and females. And you can just see us there tracking a shark in the, in the bay. Just so you're quickly familiar with the area, hands by being the sort of danger point, uh, the inshore of danger point. We've got Shark Alley and Giza Rock and Dyer Island as our sort of field aggregation complex. And on Dyer Island, we have a breeding colony of South African penguins. The inshore of the bay is characterized by reefs. And those reefs are where the cage diving boat, eight of them, actually focus their effort. So there you can see, again, just as the point of five quickly. And obviously, the conditions aren't always perfect. Some days, it gets really rough out there. It's Dyer Island. There's a lot of abalone poachers. <laughs> so there's many challenges in this sort of data collection. But we managed to get over 500 hours of data, which was pretty cool. And you can see this is one of the analyses I did. It was actually the second chapter of my PhD, now published. Um, and so the red, the black, and the gray are all GPS positions of where our sharks were. But we used what we call hidden markup modeling techniques, which allowed us to sort of figure out what were the, two, the, the different behavioral states of the sharks in the area. If the uh, dots that you see are black, that means the shark was doing area-restricted movement, so it was actually in a high-energy state. And the red overlaid with that is actually cage diving boat presence. So it's a no-brainer. When a great white does decide to go to a cage diving boat, it circles the boat. So it's shorter step length between the GPS positions and tighter turning angles. So they're things that we can use for the quantitative analysis. The gray dots are more relaxed behavior. That's what we call state two behavior, i.e. shark is patrolling the beach. It's digesting its food. The blue dorsal fins you see are predation events. So it happened on about six occasions. The shark we were tracking actually killed the seal in front of us. And then we learned that great white sharks can actually be both ambush predators and active searchers. So they can essentially be Nile crocodiles waiting for the the, wild, the wildebeest to come over the river, or they can be leopards that chase down their prey to exhaustion, or they can switch between modes, which is quite rare in predator ecology. Oliver Jewell, a colleague of mine, he now works in Australia. He spent quite a few years in Dyer Island uh, doing, this, doing this project with me. He used five of the animals and analyzed the data in a different way. So he looked at core habitat use of white sharks in Dyer Island, and again, he found this diurnal pattern. But what's interesting is opposite to Kay in that he found more shark activity in the full moon. But I wonder if that's not to do with the fact that this is a seal colony. And you would imagine these are visual predators. Probably they can hunt more effectively in the lighter conditions. Both of the sampling beaches that Kay was at are inshore environments. So perhaps all the sharks were at the island hunting seals in full moon. We can't say that for sure, but it's an interesting complementary um, observation. Shark Alley itself, we saw some of the most area-restricted searching in predators. It was incredible. Literally the whole day the sharks would patrol this narrow channel. So yeah, just in a nutshell, I've already been through what the uh, summarized uh, topics were there from, from the tracking, but 
very site-specific behavior. So what we're seeing in hand by is not necessarily what Alison will see in uh, False Bay or that scientists will see further down the coast. Remember that habitat really does scope the predator paradigm. And Dyer Island is the only aggregation site for great whites as a sealed colony that has dense forests of kelp around it. And the kelp itself provides a different sort of layer into the predator-prey, uh, particularly the seal-shark interaction. Cage diving boats, I just want to finish with that. That's very important. Um, we noticed any shark that went to the boats over time lost interest. And of course, they did induce that state one behavior, which again, it's not something that we um, was new. So the other way you can track sharks, of course, is passively. You don't have to follow them around and stalk their lives. You can just wait for them to pass by your receivers along the coast. Both Alison and I have uh, our arrays set up in Hans by and False Bay, which are part of a national collaborative array. So that's actually what um, my final chapters of my PhD are now looking at, is where the sharks I've tagged in Hans by have moved and how they behave in that area with the chumming boats versus elsewhere down the coast. So finally, I'm just going to finish on this last case study. Um, quick, quick. I don't know how much time I've got left. Fine. Yep. Um, we have seen a big change in white shark distribution the last couple of years in South Africa, and it's become quite well known. Um, many theories as to whether it is actually an eastward shift or whether it's a decline in numbers. Some theories flying around as to why this has happened, environmental influences, oceanography changes due to climate change or development of the coasts, fisheries, longliners, uh, removal of prey species of our sharks, uh, removal of smaller shark species, even the octopus traps are a, a theory behind it. So taking away the prey of the prey of the white shark, causing them to move, um, and of course, killer whales. So what happened in 2017 in Hans Bay got quite a lot of media attention because I think it was the first time that really we'd seen great white sharks being outrivaled in the food chain so dramatically. And it was the first time ever that carcasses had washed out and scientists were able to verify that it was, it was killer whale predation. So this paper's um, in review at the moment. Alison's on board with it. Um, Fear at the trap, trophic cascades amongst marine top predators is what we've called it, because there's so much more to this story than just killer whales eating sharks. So first of all, I'll just introduce you to the uh, naughty two. They're actually the most well-studied orcas, uh, well studied orcas here in South Africa. So possibly brothers, we don't know that, but we know they're two males and they're together a lot. They have very distinctive dorsal fins, which is quite rare in the wild, this droops over flaccid fin. Uh, in captivity, it's very common. It's actually almost all of them due to stress. Uh, we don't know exactly what's caused it, but it makes them very easily identifiable. They're actually relatively small for orca as well. They're about seven meters long. Now, last Year, sorry, 2017, February the 9th, we got a call out for a small female that had washed up dead on Pearly Beach, which is just around the corner from Hansby. When we got to her and we examined her, she still had a liver. There was no real conspicuous marks on her, a few scratches on the head. But what stuck in everybody's mind is the exact day before Port and Starboard had been in Hansby hanging around on the inshore, very, very slowly, around where the cage diving boats were with great white sharks, and we knew there was a quite a good aggregation of them. Then in May, this is what started to happen. Carcass after carcass washed out. So this is an incredibly large white shark. Um, she was five meters, pretty much. She weighed 1.1 ton, tons, minus her liver. And uh, I had her in our database at Dyer Island the year before. Um, you can see that's just what it looks like when you retrieve an animal of that size from the beach. This is the CEO of Marine Dynamics and the Dyer Island Conservation Trust, Wilfred Chibble, big conservationist kind of knows what's coming for his business at this point, <laughs> looking quite worried. Um, there we are just maneuvering that animal onto the back of her vehicle. And as you can see, there's a big tear in her. And when we did the necropsy, we found she had no liver. Alison came through from False Bay. We've got Megan McCord there. You probably don't recognize her now with the short hair. Um, this is Dr. Malcolm Smale. He flew in from PE. And we all got together for this necropsy and were absolutely amazed by what we saw. The fact that the shark had no liver and that's my dad sitting on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> proud dad moment! <laughs> and you know how proud he was of his daughter sitting and watching her? Um, this was also the day that we were really baffled that this animal was still reproductively immature and she was five meters. So we, we learned a lot that day and it was really a, quite a monumental time in our careers, but worrying because that was not the only carcass to wash out. There were more to follow. And let me just put it out there. At this point, this wasn't new, because in False Bay, off Miller's Point, 
Tammy, who presented to you yesterday, she's put out a paper now on how these two same killer whales have slaughtered seven gill sharks there in the exact same way, removing their livers and just discarding the carcass. And in the wake of that, the ecology of false bay changed as well. So we know what they're capable of. We're now seeing this happen to the white sharks. Of course, what an incredible sampling opportunity. We're taking muscle tissue, genetic samples, isotopes, vertebrae. We wash down the whole necropsy area. That very night, the next shark washes in, dead, minus its liver. This was a smaller male. Um, he had his testes and his heart gone as well. Poor guy. Um, and it just continued. This was two days later in Strace by. And each time our team have to go there, we have to maneuver this huge fish off the high, high water mark, get it back, and then get the necropsy prepared. And what was really striking is all these animals were huge. They were big, great white sharks. There we are again doing the necropsies. And then finally, this was the last animal to wash in in Pearly Beach. This was 24th of June. And I'll never forget this day because it was just three of us on the beach. And I remember looking up at the ocean and then seeing our whale boat just on the back line and getting a call from the skipper, guess who's here, port and starboard. Now that shark might look a bit old because it's white. It may have been dead for a few days. I dispute that because imagine how much you would bleed out if you lost your liver in the ocean. So when they get the livers ripped out, they bleed out very fast, giving them this very white appearance. Finally, this is just a rundown of the paper that we're busy with at the moment. So the red dots being the white shark carcasses, the green dots being my acoustic array in Hansby, and then Enrico Gennari has his acoustic array in Mossel Bay. So what we did here is we tracked the orcas all around Hansby. We obviously necropsied the sharks. These are tag sharks of mine that fled east at the exact time that the orcas came through. And all of this made quite an interesting story. So each time the killer whales came in, you can see at the beginning, the sharks didn't really know what they were up against. So there was very temporary fleeing of the area, but then the numbers resumed again. This is boat-based data from cage diving boats in Mossel Bay and the hands by, sorry, it's a research boat in Mossel Bay. So red being Mossel Bay white sharks, black being hands by. So each time the orcas came in, there was a clear out event, and eventually the sharks stayed away for a very, very long time. But as you can see, the numbers picked up in Mossel Bay in the wake of that. The blue is another type of shark, Carcarinus brachiaris, or the bronze whaler, which has now resumed the top trophic position in hands by. In fact, if you, can go, if you go and book a cage dive there today, you will see that type of shark. And again, that shows that the whole ecology of the area has now changed. Underwater, it's a similar story. Remember, we have passive acoustic receivers on the seabed in Hansby, also in Mossel Bay. So you can see the blue is our white sharks in Hansby that were tagged. They moved and they became more prominent in Mossel Bay over time. And every time the orca came in, particularly at the end there, they like now, if I've actually got the data to extend this graph to 2019, you'll see that there's not been a single white shark in Hansby picked up on the receivers. And the orcas came in another time and completely, completely dead. So really, really interesting. Uh, the seals and the penguins are affected in the Dire Island system because what happens to seals that don't have predators curbing their numbers? They become less vigilant. And then they feel free that they can just go and feed on penguins when they want. And the horrible thing about that is we have 750 breeding pairs of South African penguins on Dire Island. When I started there 12 years ago, it was 1,500. So the numbers are going down and down. In that time frame, they've become endangered. And they can't afford any more pressures against them. Plus, they've just been fishing. They've probably had to go 50 kilometers out to find red eye and pilchards to eat. As they've got back to the island, the seal has targeted them for their stomach contents only. So it's a really delicate situation. And in response to this, we had to, Cape Nature had to actually cull some of the Cape fur seals. So that's just two graphs that show numbers of bites on penguins increasing and numbers of seals being culled increasing in the wake. And of course, the social economics get affected. Hans is a cage diving town. It's also a fishing town. And that's a lot of livelihoods there. So passages statistics show very clearly that in the wake of the orcas visiting and killing white sharks, numbers of tourists have gone down. Luckily, the copper sharks, sorry, the bronze whalers, have been pretty good at stabilizing things for now. But we hope, well, we don't know what the future holds in that re respect. So it's a really delicate balance in our ocean ecosystems. I think even almost more so than on land. Um, and just by taking a uh, predator away, we change the whole, the whole um, sort of dynamics. Uh, white sharks, as we know, are already very threatened. They don't need orcas to start eating them. So if we cause that, have we taken away perhaps the prey species of the orca, the smaller sharks, forcing them to go for higher risk prey? There's so many unknowns. 
but also fear effects must never be overlooked when it comes to ecosystem ecology. So just because the orcas aren't there doesn't mean that the white sharks are not going to respond to the fact they may be there. And if you compare it to terrestrial environments like the Serengeti, you've got lions being introduced into areas and becoming more prolific in number. Both leopards and wild dogs use different strategies to deal with that. Your leopards will change their daily habits and they will scope their movement into lesser risk time for the lions. The wild dogs will completely change their distribution and move way out of the area. And it seems to be that the white sharks have followed on that kind of a behavior, uh, a little bit like the wild dogs in the Serengeti, as a terrestrial comparison. So last but not least, I'm finished. I just wanted to play one movie of an interaction we had of one white shark in Anthi last year, because even though we didn't see many, uh, this was quite cool. He came and he uh, investigated a baited remote underwater video uh, videography system uh, that we had down on the inshore reef. And there's something about great whites that, I guess, with this guy, he seems to be almost anticipating that he wants to push the bruv away from the reef, and he's a bit stubborn about it. So I'm going to finish by playing that. I'm going to pass you on to Alison, and then we'll take questions at the end, yeah? So here's the, the footage of the bruv. <laughs> He's persistent though. <laughs> <laughs> so much more to these sharks than people give them credit for. Thank you very much for listening. That's why research is so expensive, because that's what they do to our research equipment. Exactly. Great. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, uh, yeah, there's something about a white shark. We have uh, learned a lot about uh, various species, and, and that's really important for us because, uh, of course, the white shark has got a lot of protections on it already, um, and, uh, and the other shark species don't. Um, so we need to highlight those other species, and they are fascinating in their own way. Um, but I have spent the last 20 years studying great whites, and, um, and they really are fascinating creatures. I struggled um, with what to present to you today, and in fact, um, my presentation changed from what I was going to present to you to what it is now. And um, I thought that I, what I would try and do is um, just pick some of the highlights um, from the research findings out of uh, False Bay. For you. So I started in 1998. That was the first time I saw a great white shark, and it was from a, a cage diving vessel based at Seal Island. And um, uh, I was told that I was going to see these these great whites breach and jump out of the water. And I really thought they were having me on. I thought it was an April Fool's joke. And um, this was before anything was known about these sharks, really, in Cape Town. And um, I went out on the boat. And we were there for five minutes at Seal Island in False Bay. And literally, a white shark breached completely out of the water, 10 meters from the boat, and I was hooked. That was it. That was me for the next 20 years. And um, I realized that when I was asking questions about the white sharks, that we really didn't know anything about them. And um, the only previous uh, information we had was that they occasionally um, uh, attacked people uh, in False Bay, and that fishermen used to catch them along the Macassar inshore areas. But that was it. 
And so um, that's where my journey started. So what I'm going to do is just, I've only got um, 15 minutes, going to briefly go through some of the studies and the findings that we've done. All of these are available. Um, I can send them to you. My email address is at the end. And uh, if you want more detail on the methods um, or uh, all the results, I can always discuss those with you and send you the, the studies. But the very first uh, study I was involved with was looking at the hunting behavior of these great whites around the seal colony. And um, what I quickly learned as a, as a field guide on this uh, cage diving boat was that uh, the patterns were far from random. And um, we started to see that these attacks on these seals, um, this is a phenomenal picture, uh, the seal escaped in, all the pictures in this actually, the seal escaped. Um, uh, the seal escaped here, um, but we would uh, log the GPS, the date, the time, um, whether it was a successful event, whether it was unsuccessful, what behavior occurred um, during those really phenomenal predator-prey interactions. And so some of the first results I, I ever got was for an honors project where uh, I documented um, the uh, location of these attacks on these seals around Seal Island. So, um, so in False Bay, most of you know where Seal Island is. It's just eight kilometers from Musenberg. Um, and, and we documented hundreds and now thousands of these attacks on seals at this island. And you can clearly see already that um, the, the attacks are focused along the southern side of the island and the southwestern side. And there's a very clear explanation for that uh, that we found out. Uh, number one, the topography is deep enough so that the sharks can launch these ambush attacks. Um, and number two, this is where the seal movement was. This is where most of the seals were moving from. Um, so uh, what we did was we tagged sharks, we tagged seals, um, and we also observed behavior. And um, we also found that most of the attacks on seals at Seal Island happened in the morning. So this graph at the bottom here is the time of day from sunrise to sunset. It's the number of attacks um, which you see. And as you can see, early morning is when most of the attacks happen. And it slowly drops off uh, over time. And we also found out that the sharks were most successful at catching the seals uh, first, um, the first hour after sunrise. So they were using the low light conditions to successfully ambush these seals. We expanded on this work. This was a colleague of mine that I work with, um, Alta de Force. She did her PhD on the seal side of this predator-prey interaction. And what she was interested in was how do the seals respond to this predation? And um, you can imagine this again, um, the seal got away, and um, the experiences that seal takes back with it to the colony. Um, it learns from it. Um, seals are very social, they are very smart. Um, and what we want to know is how these white sharks um, were affecting the numbers of seals on the island and also how they were affecting behavior, because those are the two ways that predators can impact the ecosystem, is by reducing the numbers of prey and by affecting their behavior. And what we found was at Seal Island that the white sharks were not the primary reason for keeping the seal population in check. What was keeping the seal population in check was the limited size of the island. Essentially, that island has reached carrying capacity. And um, what keeps the population in check there is that every summer period, December, January, when the seal pups are born, um, there's just not enough space on the island for them all to survive. And what often happens is these seals get washed off the islands because they're on the periphery of the island and they, when they are young, they can't swim, they drown, and they land up on our beaches, um, often during the, the summer period. Um, and, and so that's actually what is keeping this population of seals in check. It's the carrying capacity of the island. It's not so much the sharks. But what we did find was that the sharks are having a very significant impact in the behavior of the seals, how the seals use the, uh, the area and, um, and, and um, the impact in terms of space use as well as seasonal use. And what we did was we used Seal Island as the experimental site 
and we used a island, a seal colony on the west coast, which doesn't have a lot of white shark activity, as the control island. And we compared, we tagged seals and, um, and the sharks, and we did observations in, in both these areas. And what we found were that um, the seals at Seal Island are all of their behavior during the winter time when the sharks are predating on them is related to trying to avoid being eaten by a shark. And this influences how they used the bay, and this influenced uh, the, the, um, the space use around the island, as well as the time of day that they, um, they were using the island. And of course, seals are top predators themselves. They are um, feeding on sharks, on other uh, species of fish, octopus. Um, and so that would then have knock-on effects on um, the other prey species as well. And in fact, you don't even have to do the science to see this difference. When you go to seal colonies, when white sharks are around during the winter season, you can see that the seals are all huddled up against the island. There's no seals playing out in the deep water. Um, it's a very different situation to when the white sharks aren't there. And in summertime, when uh, the white sharks aren't there, uh, the seals are off in deep water. They're all playing. They're all relaxed. Um, and so just by going to the seal colony, you can see when there's seals there or not. So these sharks have a very important role um, in, in determining how seals behave. This is just a quick aside. It's a, it's a very recent study that I was involved in, um, building on from uh, the work that I'd done on um, the, the hunting behavior and breaching of the sharks. Colleagues of mine um, uh, overseas documented these basking sharks breaching. Now, um, basking sharks are double the size in length than white sharks, but they're not predatory sharks. They are filter feeders. So they're feeding on zooplankton. Um, like your whale sharks, like your southern rights, um, they, they are not predatory sharks. But these colleagues of mine documented these basking sharks leaping completely out of the water. The other difference is, is that basking sharks are ectothermic and white sharks are endothermic. Um, so very different um, uh, uh, function in, in the ocean, different role in the ecosystem, but they were both breaching. Um, and what we, what we did was we compared this behavior between basking sharks and white sharks, and um, we wanted to see whether, for example, the speeds were, were different. And we all assumed that this powerful white shark would outcompete the basking shark and have way higher speeds when breaching out the water. And contrary to our findings, as science goes, um, the basking sharks uh, breached exactly the same vertical speed, 20 kilometers an hour. Uh, so exactly the same speeds as these uh, white sharks. What we don't know is why they're doing it. We know why white sharks breach, mostly to catch their food. But we don't know why basking sharks are breaching. It could be um, to get rid of parasites. It could be um, for social communication. Um, it could just be for fun. We don't know. Uh, so this is an ongoing project that I'm involved with. One of the second studies that I was involved with was looking at the impacts of uh, the cage diving operations at Seal Island and the impact on the sharks as well as the seals. I've, over the years, this was a study done and published in 2007. I've, I've given quite a few presentations on this. Essentially, uh, what we believed when we went in to study this, um, it was a, a project led by a Canadian colleague of mine from Simon Fraser University. And we hypothesized that the cage diving boats were having a significant impact on the white shark behavior. Because ultimately, that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to attract sharks to the boat and keep them there so the tourists can see them. Um, and again, we found some really interesting things, which were contrary to what we expected. The sharks, instead of staying longer and longer around the boats um, and becoming habituated to the boats, the animals that we were documenting lost interest in the boats, very similar to work that Alison has now found in, in Hansby. Um, so instead of uh, getting more accustomed to the boats and spending more time, they lost interest over time. And the reason we think this is happening is that um, even the cage diving boats that do feed sharks, they're not supposed to be feeding sharks, but we know sharks do get the tuna baits. Um, but it's not nearly enough compared to the amount of food these sharks have to get from seals. So one of the sharks that we've dissected had six full seals in its belly, six full seals. That's a huge amount compared to a tuna head. 
Um, and so what we think is that these sharks are just not getting enough of a reward from the way the cage diving operations work to, to really impact their, their behavior around the island. Their behavior is impacted primarily by the movement of the seals, because that's the main reason that they're there. After working and focusing in on Seal Island, um, this was for my master's work, uh, we had a spate of shark attacks in, in False Bay. And this was around about 2004. And um, at the time, I was the only person doing research on the sharks. And it was, uh, in fact, a very, I look back now, and it was a very challenging time for me as, as a young scientist. Um, because there was a lot of fear and emotion with regards to this uh, spate of attacks, and, and we had uh, serious injuries and we had fatalities. People were very, very upset, and you did. You had people calling for culls. Um, you, you had people that wanted shark nets. Um, people really just wanted to have a solution. They wanted to feel safe in the water again. And, um, and because I was the only one doing research on the sharks, the media came to me, and being fairly naive um, at the time, you know, I, I really, I, I didn't know as much as I know now, um, but I really felt that culling the sharks was not a good idea. Um, and, and of course, I was um, uh, quoted in the media. I got lots of hate mail. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and as a young scientist, it actually, um, I, I don't naturally have a thick skin, so it was quite difficult to get used to. Um, and, and it was a very challenging time as a scientist, um, dealing with human shark conflict, because you train to be a biologist and a scientist. At university, they don't train you to deal with human conflict, which is, is what wildlife conflict is normally is about. It's about differences of opinion between humans on what to do about a topic. Um, so, so further on this, it really uh, led me to, to expand the research. Uh, it went from just Seal Island to look at shark movements around the bay, try and understand what the sharks were doing there. You know, was this a once-off shark coming in, biting someone and leaving again? You know, or, or was this a natural event that was happening? Um, and, uh, and so uh, this led me to my PhD work. And um, one of the main discoveries from there is that um, White sharks were present in, uh, in False Bay year-round, but that they had very different um, seasonal patterns in behavior. And so what, what this graph shows you is, um, is the months of the year from January to December, and then um, the number of uh, shark uh, visits, or essentially shark activity per month, um, the um, top bar, the black bar, is for the inshore region of False Bay, so from Cape Point uh, to Musenberg to Gordons Bay to Cape Hunclip. And um, this gray bar is uh, for visits at the island. And what you can clearly see is this inverse relationship between the presence at the island, which is primarily around your winter months, and your presence inshore, which is primarily around our summer months. So this is where uh, I found that uh, it wasn't one or two sharks that were coming into the inshore area. Most of the sharks I had tagged were coming inshore, but the really interesting thing was that these were mostly female. So um, when we look at these um, inshore areas where I had tracking receivers, um, you can see that uh, Strandfontein, by far, has the highest shark activity um, on the inshore area of False Bay. And this is really driven by um, the female sharks coming inshore. And um, there was a really nice, it's probably one of my favorite headlines, because um, normally we've got you know, man-eater and um, these horrible headlines that come with sharks. And, um, and the Argus had done a story on this research. And I was driving along, and I saw a billboard, and it said, we see she sharks on the seashore. And I thought that was very clever. <laughs> um, and, and so that was from this finding that it's primarily the female sharks that are coming inshore in, in False Bay. And this is just another um, aspect of that that, um, that I've built on. These are our um, uh, graphs um, of uh, behavior during spring and summertime and behavior during autumn and winter time. 
and um, the size of the circle is the amount of um, visits. So the bigger the circle, the greater the shark activity. Um, and the thicker and greener the line, the greater the shark activity. And so what you can see here is in spring and summer, uh, primarily the sharks uh, are uh, swimming between Musenberg, Strandfontein, a little bit to offshore Strandfontein, and to Macassar. Um, and then you've got a few movements around the bay. But essentially, again, showing the highest shark activity um, is from Musenberg through to Macassar during summer. And then in autumn and winter, uh, most of the largest circle is at Seal Island there, um, and uh, you didn't have as much movement around the bay. Um, it was primarily focused around uh, Seal Island during autumn and winter. And so we went deeper into, into the work, and this is um, a, a master's student that I had working on some of the, the longer term data that we'd been collecting. This is the um, demographics of the sharks that we've documented over the years. So you've got uh, the size of the white shark um, from under two meters. Uh, the last bar there is over five and a half meters. We haven't seen a shark that size in False Bay. Um, and then the white bars are your males and the gray bars are your females. And um, this is thousands of shark sightings. And what you can see very clearly is that most of the sharks, male and female, fit into your three to three and a half meter category. And, uh, and when you really look into this more deeply, that blue line is where most male white sharks reach maturity. So we don't have many mature uh, male white sharks, um, pre uh, predominantly juveniles and subadults. And that is where most females are supposed to reach sexual maturity. So although the sharks are big, three and a half meters is a big shark. Four meters is a big shark. Um, but as, as Ali said, that five meter shark we dissected um, was sexually immature. So, so primarily, we've got these juveniles and sub-adults um, that are in the bay. And when we look at um, shark sightings over time, uh, you may remember this picture from, from day one um, of a particular shark that we've documented over many years using the dorsal fin ID. Um, this is how we worked out the graph you see here. So this is the number of years that sharks have been recited. So at zero year, we only saw it on one year. So there was no years that it was recited. With the one there, it's been cited for more than one year. Okay, and as you can see, most of our shark sightings, we only see them for one year. We might see some for, for more than a year, and a couple, um, we've had one animal, uh, which is this one, which was over a six year period. But most of the sharks um, that we see are, are what we call transient. They'll come in um, for a season, maybe two, and then we won't see them again. And uh, what we actually found out was that um, once sharks reach that size where they are changing from a sub-adult to an adult is when we saw them leaving the area and not coming back again. Um, and it was really interesting for us because it was very different to what had been found from other aggregation sites around the world. Um, so, so the question is, where, where do they go? So now we know that it's an important...